so Namho Park is up next. Namho is, uh, he leads creative web and mobile strategy and solutions development for nonprofit, government, and issue-driven clients. Uh, he's been active in web technologies and crafting user experience for over 16 years, both in the US and in Asia. He holds a master's degree in architecture, the, the physical kind, and he's, um, he teaches at uh, the UW Information School. And uh, I met Namho uh, recently at a uh, IAUX meetup, and we had a brief, all too brief, but uh, uh, interesting conversation in which I went back to my seat and wrote down just about everything he said, because I didn't want to forget it, and I knew he'd make a great uh, addition to our lineup today. So please welcome Namho Park. All right, uh, this, is, this is a really um, um, difficult position to be in, to stand between people and their beer, obviously. And, but you know, Jared Spool put this uh, very uh, um, acutely when he said that it is you who stand between me and my beer as well. <laughs> Quoting Jared Spool there. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that, that kind of, uh, one of the pet peeves that I have uh, around uh, architecture and information architecture, I've been in both fields uh, um, quite a bit, is when people use the word architect as a verb. It's like, I cringe every time because architect is a person who creates architecture and not architects things, right? So uh, just keep that in mind that when you, when you talk to me after this uh, uh, talk, <laughs> please do not use the word architect in a verb form and I will walk away from you. So just uh, <laughs> keep that in mind. So, okay, uh, um, you know, as, a, as an information architect, as a user experience professional, I'm gonna talk about my user experience journey, okay? So uh, I work for Forum One. Um, Forum One, uh, as, uh, as Stuart uh, mentioned, we work for nonprofits, foundations, and government agencies, and we're a full service digital agency with, with our main office in Alexandria, Virginia. We have a smaller office uh, in, uh, in Seattle, uh, supporting the Gates Foundation, among other, other organizations. And uh, here are some of the clients that we work with. Okay, enough about Forum One. Okay, so um, some of you may have seen this uh, part. I was born here. And then, I went to Rabat when I was one. And I went to London, and that's why I have this weird accent. <laughs> and then I went back. 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 And then finally, I went back. And um, after a while, uh, I went to uh, college. Uh, I, I went to grad school in New York where I studied architecture. And that's where I got my Master of Architecture degree. And uh, after a little while, um, after getting my architecture degree, you know, I, this whole thing called this internet was happening all around me. And I decided to uh, dabble a little bit in this thing called the internet. And I dipped my little toe in it, and of course, that has become my career ever since. But I've never lost this kind of love of architecture. And I've always wanted to find a way to kind of, you know, understand the world of information architecture and user experience with a lens of architecture. Uh, after New York, um, ended up in uh, Washington, DC, where I started working for Forum One. And then in 2007, I went back to Korea, worked for a digital agency, worked for a nonprofit, worked for a university. Uh, and then while I was there, I went to Hanoi and worked on an um, urban design project, urban planning project actually, where um, the company that um, I was working for actually won the commission to uh, redesign uh, and reimagine what Hanoi could look like in 2030. It, this, was a, this was a project with the, uh, the Ministry of Construction in uh, Vietnam and it was, it was the most stressful time in my life by far. Uh, I do not want to remember, I, my, my fists are, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was by far the most stressful time in my life, but I learned so much. I learned so much about um, how to negotiate, how to uh, understand, how to communicate with people who know almost nothing about what you're trying to do. So I went back to Korea, and then uh, in 2011, hey, look, I ended up in Seattle, and that's where I've been for the last four and a half years. So as an as a information architect, as a person who works in design, of course, I have to have an infographic that represents, you know, uh, exactly where I've been and how long I've been there, right? So, so here's, here's, here's that infographic. Another infographic is, you know, which fields I've been in and how long have, I've been engaged in, the, in, 
each of those fields. So as you can see, I have a, uh, you know, these are two sides of my brain, really. It's like the architecture part, which talks about the physical design of space and programming of space. And then there's the user experience and the information architecture part, which talks about the physical organization virtual organization of information and how to deliver that in a coherent and exciting user experience, right? So that's two parts of my brain that I'm going to try to meld together. And I, and I, and I realize now we live in a culture, we live in a time, we need to live in a technological time where actually the two are converging uh, inseparably together. And I realized that I am actually more in designing experiences than actually thinking about these things in a different way. Physical architecture and information architecture are communicating with each other, and I'm, I'm going to try to tell you how they're doing that. And what I've learned from uh, physical architecture that has informed my information architecture and user experience practice. This is what studio used to look like in the late 90s, right? Uh, people sitting at the desk, and this hasn't changed much in you know, you know, thousands of years. You know, people have sat at their desks and designed things uh, to be built. And you, know, you see the lonely computer over there, right? And a couple of laptops. This is, this is how people were, were beginning to you know, do things. Um, I, I still bought um, a parallel rule when I started school, uh, and I, I, I drew lines, you know, and I uh, used ink. And you know, but where I went to school, which was Columbia University, uh, that was actually in the midst of transforming, and they started the first paperless studio, whatever that means. Um, they they brought in uh, computers, silicon graphics machines, and they adopted um, uh, uh, soft image or soft image, if you if you're French, uh, and. Um, <laughs> And uh, alias and uh, a lot of these uh, uh, software that were that, that were being used in uh, industrial design as well as uh, the movie industry um, to see what will actually you know architecture will be created, uh, what kind of architecture will be created. Architecture has this thing, and it's with all professions that the tool really governs the way that you design things, right? So if you have a tool, if you have a piece of paper about this big, right, you'll probably be making a lot of designs that are about this this big. Right? So architecture profession has always had the parallel role, the triangles, right? So no wonder all architecture looks like this, right? It's all parallel and it's all kind of angular, right? Uh, and so when you start introducing computers, computers don't care about straight lines or curved lines. It's all compute, computation to them. They don't have a bias. Whereas if you want to draw a, draw a curvy line, as you know, me as a human being, it's really hard to do that, right? And for a contractor to take that curvy line and produce a piece of architecture is even harder. So there's been constraints because of the tools that we use that architecture has not really been able to explore uh, fluid form. While I was doing this, while I was at architecture school, uh, at 1 o'clock in the morning each day, I was doing this. All right, this is this is marathon for those old timers out there. You know, we, we used to go down to the uh, the computer lab and shoot each other to death about two hundred times by you know five o'clock in the morning, and uh, and then we would go back and sleep and then start studio all over again. But the interesting thing here is that here's this bifurcation exactly. I mean, there's the virtual world where we're killing each other, and then there's the physical world where we're designing stuff right for to be actually built, and w w they're both the same really. I mean, I'm running around this space as if this space actually exists, right? And you know, I'm going to back and forth from school as if this space really exists. And they do. And both of them actually exist. In my mind, they were both real, right? That one wasn't virtual and one wasn't real. They were both really real. Did I say really real? <laughs> yeah. And you know, you have this kind of matrix moment where you start to see beyond, you know. Uh, the, 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 the physical world and you see things as information, right? This is what happens to Neo. He, 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 he goes beyond the physical and starts to see the information behind the physical, right? And that's what information architects do. And that's what architects do as well. When I look at this room, I see the information. Whoa. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, you, do, you guys do the same thing as well, right? Or is it just me? Okay, anyway, 
but I saw, I saw um, you know, the, the startings, the beginnings of the virtual and the physical coming together. One of the first books that I read when I went to uh, New York was uh, Paul Auster's City of Glass. This is a mind-blowing book if you haven't read this. And what was even mind-blowing about the book it was that it was actually, I was reading this book which talked about the neighborhood that I was actually living in. There was this guy hired, well, the, the main character is hired by a mysterious woman who comes and says, can you please follow this old man around the city? And this old man just goes around, and this guy is, is, you know, starts to map out, you know, literally where this guy travels every day and starts to see patterns, right? Albeit imaginary patterns, right? And he tries to make sense of that. So here, we, here, we, here again, we see the physical and the informational kind of overlapping. And it's kind of really weird that I read this book when I first got to Columbia. I'll say why it's weird a little bit later. But uh, so, so, so a lot of technological things have happened since you know, the late 90s uh, and you know, everywhere, all, going all the way back to the mid 70s that have allowed this moment in time to exist where information architecture and architecture are becoming inseparable. This is, uh, this is uh, um, Martin Cooper. Uh, he is uh, widely credited for inventing the first cell phone. And this is what it looks like. Uh, it, it was much bigger than this, actually. It was actually in a suitcase, but this is a much uh, smaller version of this. And if you look at uh, movies from the 80s, you see people carrying these things, right? And you know what you can do with them? You can actually make calls on them, and that's all you can do, right? And then this guy came around and said, oh, you know, Screw calling, you know, let's do something else with this. Let's put the power of a supercomputer into a phone and stack it with all these different features and actually allow you to do a lot more things with this than, than you have imagined, right? Uh, how many of you, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you're doing something on your, on your iPhone or your, or your uh, uh, Android phone and a call comes in, you think, oh, forget it, I'm not gonna answer that. And it's called an iPhone. Right? And, and you're not using it as a phone anymore. You're using it as so many other things than just a phone, right? And, and you, you realize that this is a Cray XMP from the mid 80s, right? Whoa. Computers used to look like that back, back then. Cray XMP, it was six, $60 million, right? But you have the power of a Cray XMP in your pocket right now. That's just, I mean, mind blown. Right, but you. But the thing is, so um, so a couple of things are converging here. So uh, we have a smartphone technology, right, and we have the power, a supercomputer in our compute uh, in our pockets, and on top of that, we have a GPS, right? We have uh, we have this amazing you know, satellites going about. I don't know how GPS works, but I just know that it tells me where I am right now, and that you know I'm supposed to be here, right? So there's GPS, there's there's mobile computing. Uh, there's there's the super the power of a supercomputer in your pocket, and on top of that, there's ubiquitous connectivity. Right, you can go anywhere. I mean, you don't need you're, you're cordless, right? You can you can actually take your phone, you can take your iPad, you can take them everywhere. Meaning that you're not tethered to uh, a, a physical location, and you can actually move about, uh, creating more information or consuming information within that space. Right. So you have augmented reality that combines this layer of com uh, uh, um, information. So we have the internet, and we have uh, ubiquitous connectivity, and then we have this thing called a smartphone. Combine, smash those three things together, and then on the on the physical level that we're here, I mean, with the physical world that, where we're residing right now, where we're sitting right now, you have this invisible information layer that you can access at any given moment, right? So. Going back to that, going back to that, uh, the city of glass, right? So uh, Andrew Morton again, you know, he <laughs> uh, he he uh, he um, he posted this uh, uh, a couple of days ago in our internal chat. Uh, it, it's uh, how many of you um, uh, you know bicycle and use Strava, this app called Strava, on a regular basis? A couple of you, right? So this is an app that tracks where you're going. Uh, and 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 uh, when you're bicycling or when you're running, and it maps it against a map, and it tells you how many uh, miles that you've done and how many uh, calories that you've burned, which is a really amazing app. What people have started to do is creating Strava art, right? They would bike hundreds of miles just to create a cat drawing, 
or, or, or like a bicycle drawing. It's kind of self-referential, but you know, people do that because they can. They have the technology to do that. And the, here's again a melding of the informational space and the physical space. And of course, we have projects like this. Well, we'll skip that one. And we have projects like this. Well, the interesting thing about this is, you know, no longer are you creating a, an informational layer on top of the physical world. You're actually creating a whole new world by itself, where you're being immersed in a in in, in something like this, where you can actually, you know, experience a full degree of motion uh, and uh, and the the environment around you, which actually starts to feel real. Of course, thankfully, this technology has pro progressed to something like this which is actually a little bit more wearable and buyable, right? Who wants to buy something like this, right? Or work in a place where everybody's putting something like this on their heads. Nice try, but you know, this is much better, of course. Um, but, and this is gonna become available pretty, pretty soon. And for those of you who haven't tried this, this is just amazing. I mean, as, as a person who's studied architecture, you know, once I put one of these things on my head, I, you know, my mind went absolutely crazy at all the uh, possibility that you can have with something like this. You're not going anywhere, but you can go, you know, I mean, think of Google Maps, right? Or Google Earth. When, my, when, when I showed Google Earth to my father for the first time, you know, he, he um, I mean, he, during the Korean War, he came from North Korea to South Korea, and, you know, we've lived in South Korea ever since. And, and the first thing that he did when he saw Google Maps is find where he used to live in North Korea. And it was just the most uh, emotional kind of uh, experience uh, for him because he could actually visit somewhere that he had lost touch with for all those years, since 1953 to be exact, right? So imagine what he'll feel if he puts on something like this on his head and actually walks through the valley that he used to you know, uh, run around as a child, right? So you know, the actual physical experience of inhabiting a space combined with virtual and uh, comp computational power that supports that is actually an amazing um, uh, coming together of, again, information architecture, the information layer, and the physical layer. And then we have um, uh, things like this where, you know, it's, it's called a cave, it's called a virtual cave, where you can actually uh, go into a room with projections on, you know, all the sides, and you can actually, uh, in this case, you know, see things uh, three-dimensionally because um, it's, it's, uh, you have you know, um, these, these glasses on that give you a perception of depth and uh, three-dimensionality. Why would you use something like, like this as opposed to something like this? Of course, it's because you can inhabit a space together and you can walk around the space together. And you know, a lot of the times, the, the experience of space like we have here right now is social, right? You want to experience the space. You want to experience the space not purely because you want to run around and kill people, uh, but you want to actually converse with people. You want to have a relationship with people, right? And this is what Second Life attempted to do way back when. You know, we know where Second Life went. But, you know, the amazing thing about Second Life was that it showed us the possibilities of what something like this could bring us, right? And it is, sorry. And it is the fact that Human beings need to be grounded in something that they understand, and thousands, if not millions, of years of evolution has taught us to experience space and understand space and relate to space. And that is the baseline. So if we're designing informational spaces in the virtual reality realm, unless we are wired differently, we will have to be grounded in physical metaphors. There's a ground plane. I mean, of course, you can fly, but there always has to be a ground plane. Or, you know, we, had to, we have to relate to each other with, with, with the scale of a human body, right? This is what Second Life is doing. There's chairs. There's, you know, why would, help, would you want chairs in a virtual space? I mean, you can't even sit down. But why are people sitting down in virtual space? It's because they're used to people sitting down in physical spaces, and that brings them comfort, right? If you're just flying around talking to each other, Maybe you're used to something like that sometimes. You know, this is a very liberal state. But, um, but, you know, most people aren't. And they need to be sitting and facing each other when they're talking because that is the social relationship that they've had and have developed within physical space. 
But again, it shouldn't be tied just to that. You can explore new things. You can explore new relationships. And the internet and you know, the power of computing does open yourself up, open new possibilities up for new configurations of space, new configurations of human relationships, and all those other things. If it wasn't for Facebook, how would anybody be connected to you know, uh, a, million, a billion people around the world and be connected to your family or your friends in the way that you, we are right now? OK, so what are? <laughs> What has architecture taught me about information architecture? That was all preamble, by the way. <laughs> what architecture has taught me, first and foremost, that it is a layering of complex systems. When you look at this building right now that you're in, it is a layering of complex systems. Um, I mean, you have the structure. You have uh, the HVA system, like this, that allows you to have cool air coming in. You have the circulation that's coming in, that allows you to, you know, 100 people coming into a room and actually sitting down. You have the programming that happened so that you can actually have large rooms, small rooms, and other rooms, right? And then you have staircases, and you have a roof, you have an enclosure, you have all of these things. Uh, you have interior design, and then you have all the cultural things that go uh, along with that. And so architecture, what architecture school has taught me uh, that translates directly to information architecture and user experience is that it's a complex layering of systems. And you guys, as information architects, are the people who are taking a look at really complex systems and laying it out and layering it in a way that actually makes sense to people, right? to users. You can take the most hideously messy databases and pieces of information, structure it, you know, taxonomize the heck out of it, and uh, and, and organize it in an informational structure that can be displayed on a web page or a mobile phone and actually mean something to somebody. That's what you do. You are masters of layering complex systems. And that's what architecture actually is. If you take a look at this, this is the Sosolo Library at the University of Washington, what do you see? You see a big space. But to me, what I see is you have Gothic architecture. Why the hell is a library housed in a Gothic piece of architecture? I don't know. But it, you know, it's, because, it's because there's a certain presence. There's a certain thing that a Gothic architecture brings, which is you know, solemn. It's religious. So it's a, it's, it's a religious expression of knowledge, I guess. But you know, that's one layering of information that's happening. That's a complex system. That's a cultural system that's been layered on top of this. There's also the structural system. There's also the lighting that comes into it. There's also the way that the book stacks have been configured and the, uh, and the desks have been configured, right? So that's, or somebody had to think that through. Somebody took the time to layer those complex systems in a way that it creates a beautiful, amazing experience. And that's what information architects do. Here's another example. I'll skip this one. But um, <laughs> this is Zaha Hadid in, in Seoul. This is the Dongdaewon Design Plaza. But again, you know, it is, you know, this is one expression. And you know, some some people might look at this as, as a as a big blob, and a lot of people do in Korea. But you know, to me, it is it is an expression of our times. The fact that something like this can be built even is amazing. And the technology and the layering of complex systems that goes into this, I think I have a I have a deep appreciation for what actually went in and the political battles that need to be fought in order for this to happen. And that's why I put it in there. But Jesse James Garrett has this uh, really, I mean, this still tr holds really true uh, today. I mean, uh, as you study information architecture, I'm sure you've seen this diagram before. But it layers all the different layers of uh, information architecture. Everything from the visual layer, where it interacts with the users, all the way down to the, the site objectives and user needs, and the functional layers, and the interaction layers, and the information design layers. But basically, again, this is a, uh, a complex layering of this is a layering of complex systems that we as user experience professionals and information architects are constantly negotiating and having to think about. When you see a site like this, it's really simple. It's simple. But you know it's not simple to create something like this. And again, there's a, there's a complex layering and understanding of the systems in order to create something as simple and, and user-focused and elegant as an as a Airbnb site. The second thing is um, it's about the sequencing of experiences. Where you have the layering of complex, uh, complexity, it is also about experience, user experience. Right? Information architecture serves a purpose. Right? It is to create experiences that are compelling and, 
and, and desirable. Um, this, is my, uh, this is my dean at, at uh, Columbia University at the Graduate School of uh, um, Architecture, Planning, and Pre Preservation. His name is Bernard Chumy. Uh, he's he's a, a French Swiss. And uh, he, 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 he was a big deal. Uh, he, he was a big deal because of many things. Because um, he wrote a book uh, in the 80s called The Manhattan Transcripts. Uh, it was an architecture book, but there was no architecture in it. It was just full of photos like this, cryptic photos. But what his point was, was that let's get away. Let's challenge the notion of architecture as building, but architecture as experience and architecture as event. Right? And that really informed a lot of the work that happened at the Graduate School of uh, Architecture Planning and Preservation. Oh, he was the first one to introduce computers to the program as well. Um, and that has influenced me quite a bit in terms of thinking about architecture and information architecture. Architecture isn't just simply about the building, it's about what happens in the building. And you know, as we as information architects and user experience professionals are deeply concerned about what happens to our users. Uh, this is the Japanese garden. Uh, in, in Seattle, and Japanese gardens have this, you know, it's amazing, it's a layering of experiences, it's the sequencing of experiences. If you go to a Japanese garden, nothing is there that wasn't deliberately put there to allow you to experience something, whether that be views, angles, events, you know, a, a sudden discovery of a pagoda, but every single place has been sequenced and ordered in a way that creates this unified experience. It's, it's quite amazing if you haven't been there already. And if you go to Rome, um, the landmarks have been placed around Rome. Same with Paris, same with you know, most uh, old metropolitan uh, uh, cities. Uh, uh, landmarks have been placed there for the purpose of for people to navigate and, and so that you can sequence the experiences. If you've been to Rome, where the Colosseum appears, you know, uh, where the uh, where, where certain you know architecture appears is sequenced in a way, and if you take a look at uh, the way that the the old um, cathedrals are placed, it, it is actually placed there in a way in a sequence of uh, for pilgrims to migrate from one cathedral to another, and the same with you know um, uh, the the monasteries and and the and the and the, um, that that line the um, uh, the west coast, right? Everything from San Francisco all the way to um, I can't remember, but there were, there were there were a sequence of those, uh, mon um, those religious buildings so that pilgrims can make that pilgrimage uh, one day at a time. If you go to um, uh, Lincoln Square um, in, uh, uh, in New York, um, here's, here's, a, here's a building and here's a plaza and it's sequenced in a way that where you go to the plaza and then you go through um, a modern interpretation of Gothic architecture and then you go into the performance space where you enjoy the performance has been deliberately sequenced so that you go from the city to a more private place to a community of people who love music to the enjoyment of music. Uh, as I work with students at the University of Washington, I tell them that, um, that it is about, don't, don't think about a device, don't think about a technology, don't think about the functions, think about, put it in context. What is the sequence? What is the experience that you want to be creating with, uh, with, with the thing that you're uh, with the app or with the service that you're trying to create. And at Forum One, you know, we look at user experience maps and uh, we develop them so that, again, we're not thinking of the function or the technology, but we're thinking about the sequencing of the experiences and the pain points and the, and the desires of the users. Uh, the government has been doing some really amazing work. And again, these are some really good examples of being deliberate about the sequence of experiences and configuring them in a way that really makes sense. In this case, you know, my retirement account, what do you want to do? The first thing that you want to do isn't, you know, take a look at a fancy picture, it's actually to, to, to think about how much you need to put aside to reach your goal. And so they've sequenced the experience in a way that there's a calculator right there. Another government site that recently launched is Every Kid in a Park. You know, again, there's a, there's a, there's a call there's an experience, there's a sequencing of an event. You know, you want to be out there and there's a big photograph of being out there and then you get into more of the details about how to get out there. Um, another thing is that, you know, architecture has figured out documentation. How do you, how do you create a, a, a Corinthian column? Well, you create it by, you know, reading the documentation. Plans, elevations, sections, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, 3D representation allows other people to actually create a, uh, Corinthian column. 
how in the hell do you create something like this? It's, a, it's, it's an absolute amazing fact that something like this was actually built and some contractor was willing to build it, right? Frank Gehry, um, this is another building that Frank Gehry has designed, but the, the amazing thing about, the more amazing thing about the Frank Gehry's design is that the documentation that goes into actually building something like this. Contractors, structural engineers, architects, all collaborate on the same document. They have figured it out. They don't need to understand different symbols that different you know, um, um, practices use. They have combined the symbol and the language of documentation in a way that it seamlessly goes back and forth between the structural engineer, uh, the designer, the interior designer, and everybody else. And they've ordered CAD files, computer-aided design files, in a way that you can actually start to interact with each other. Um, a shout out to Kevin Pittman over there. Uh, this, is a, this is a wireframe that he created. Um, wireframes is a way that we've started to document um, um, uh, our designs in a way that uh, designers understand it and the way that um, developers understand it. But still, is it the best way? We still have to come together in a meeting to figure out what this actually means. It hasn't been universalized. It hasn't been normalized in a way. But maybe that's an okay thing because uh, you know, software development and website development is different from architecture in the way that, you know, you don't die if documentation fails. Well, <laughs> maybe you die inside, you know, but, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's a more iterative and rapid, you know, agile approach that, you know, uh, information architects take in terms of documenting stuff. And, you know, now in our practice at Forum One, we do less and less formalized uh, wireframing. We do more sketching together collaboratively in a team. Another thing that I learned from architecture is that there's power in the grid. If you take a look at something like this, which is the Center for British Art at Yale University, I mean, there's, there's always, how many grids can you count on this thing, right? It, there's, there's a certain purity and a power that when, once you put a grid down, you can actually start to um, you know, iterate on the design and you don't have to think about what the proportioning needs to be. You know, look at all the architecture around in downtown uh, Seattle. A lot of that is governed by the grid. If you take a look at San, Fran San Francisco from, the, from an aero point of view, I caught this on a, on a plane ride. It was amazing. It's like, wow, look. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a street that goes straight down. I think this is Market Street, right? And then, and then there's the grid on either side that conforms to the way that the coastline is configured, right? It comes in and it meets at Market Street, which is diagonal, amazing. Um, and with, uh, with New York, of course, there's a, there's a really rigid grid, but grid does not mean that you lose creativity. It actually frees you to be more creative because it lays down a foundation and a rule which you can deviate from and experiment and be creative around. Uh, with uh, responsive design, we have you know, started to uh, explore the power of the grid in configuring our designs to many, to fit many small sizes and, you know, larger sizes. And there are other attempts to make things grids more formalized. Uh, if you really want to know how many combinations uh, you can form from a three by four grid, you can actually go to the site and find out. Um, somebody's actually done it for you. But again, there's, there's, there's a power inherent in using grids. Uh, there are patterns everywhere, right? Um, this, uh, this guy called Christopher Alexander in 1977 wrote this book, uh, The Pattern Language. Um, and it, it governed, you know, he, he documents in excruciating detail everything that can be patternized, right? Uh, everything from like, you know, the way that the roofs are configured, the courtyards, you know, placement of toilets, you know, everything. He, he, I mean, it's a really thick book, it's about this big. And, uh, and, and software engineering has actually taken this on and started to develop patterns that they can be used over and over again. Small patterns to larger patterns to bigger patterns and bigger patterns, etc. And this is a page from his book. If you take a look at architecture, nobody's going to tell you, nobody's going to redesign what a doorknob looks like. And nobody's going to redesign what an entry looks like. And nobody's going to redesign what a window frame looks like. Because that's all been standardized and that's been patternized. Right? And so as an architect, you have the freedom to explore different things but you know that you don't have to reinvent a window, and you don't have to reinvent a door, and you don't have to reinvent a doorknob. And, this, and just because you have those patterns, that doesn't mean that you can't be creative. And with atomic design these days, we have that movement happening where you know, smaller things, let's just agree 
that these buttons need to look this way and just be done with it. We don't have to reinvent buttons all the time and we don't have to reinvent login screens all the time. And those things can be combined in a greater whole where that frees you to do the really important things, which is sequence experiences and layer complex systems. And Google, of course, with uh, uh, material design has been attempting the same thing. There is beauty in simplicity. And this is where I don't talk at all and just show you what's simple, where you take a complex system and make it simple and elegant and beautiful. Suppressing complexity and designing beautiful things is, a, is an art in and of itself, and architects do this very well. Scale. Uh, this is the last point, actually. So uh, not too far from the beer. Architecture is about scale. It's about recognizing scale. It's about the scale of a room. It's about the scale of a chair. It's about the scale of a city, a neighborhood. Uh, you know, many, many different scales. You're constantly negotiating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between different scales. What information architecture and user experience doesn't do very well is recognize the scale of human activity. Joseph Cornell was an artist that lived in uh, New York. He lived most of his life in a small apartment with his mother. And you know, he would just go out in, the, in his neighborhood and pick up random pieces and assemble these uh, little boxes that showed an experience. I think you know, he represented as much in this as a map does. Right? So in this sense, I mean, the scale is small, but you have this con condensation of information within that scale and a recognition that these come from the neighborhoods that he would roam. If you go to a coffee shop, there's a certain scale, there's a certain interaction that happens within a coffee shop, right? You're, you, you, you sit there with a cup of coffee. You know, of course, in Seattle, when you say, hey, let's do coffee, what, what does that really mean? Does that mean you really want to do coffee with me? Is it a yes, yes, or yes, no, or no, no? I, it's kind of hard to figure out. But I've lived here four years, and when somebody says, let's do coffee, I have to ask, when? <laughs> uh, but anyway, so when you go to a, a coffee shop, there's a certain scale uh, of interaction that happens in a coffee shop. If you go to a neighborhood, I mean, think of um, a city like Seattle. How do you actually comprehend a city like Seattle? You, you comprehend it through its neighborhoods. Ballard, West Seattle, Belltown, Downtown, uh, South Lake Union, all those places, you comprehend it and you scale it to uh, uh, something that you can recognize, which is a neighborhood, right? So there's an interaction that happens with a neighborhood. And there's also you know, different qualities that happened in you know, different kinds of neighborhoods and the scale of the neighborhoods. This is Seoul, right? And, and I mean, Seoul is just one mega city. It's, I mean, Korea, South Korea is more like the Republic of Seoul than actually everything else. There's the Seoul and then there's everything else. 22 point, I think 22 million people live in Seoul or, uh, of a country of close to 50 million, which is about half the Korean population lives in Seoul. It's a mega city. You cannot comprehend the vastness of the city. But, you know, but you, at least you can understand how big it is and you know that a lot of people live there. But when I see something like this, right, this is my Twitter page, long unvisited, unloved Twitter page. Uh, <laughs> And you know, I don't really care if Twitter's advertising because I don't go there that often. But you know, I have um, I have um, uh, one still <laughs> 1,496 followers. But what does that mean? What what does a thousand people look like? And what what does conversing with a thousand people look like? It certainly does not look like this, right? How many people are in this room? You know, there's 60, maybe 70 people, close to 100 people in this room. And I know. And I can see that I cannot interact with, in, you, with you individually. I can interact with you in this way. But there's a scale that happens. But you know, information architects have this challenge of you know, displaying and trying to communicate scale with this handicap, which is a small screen and a flat screen with no depth or no conception of, uh, of, of physicality. 
And so the best that they can do is this, which is not very good. And you know, let me gripe about this guy. It's like, I mean, this is a blip in our informational history. Because, you know, people think that this is everything, but this is actually a really horrible experience, right? I mean, you're doing this, right? And you're looking at text, teeny, teeny text, right? So, I mean, if you think that this is good user experience, you should question your user experience professionality because it's not a good experience. And you should challenge that, and things are going to change. In architecture, there's a constant reinforcement of the human scale. The human is at the center of all architecture, and there's a recognition of that, whether that be the door, whether that be you know, the steps, the size of the steps, or the way that the windows are configured. There's a constant recognition of the human body in the, the architecture. And as we move more towards virtual architecture and the negotiation of virtual space, this is something that's going to become more and more prominent. And also, along with that, you have to recognize how are you going to represent scale of things, right? Um, uh, William Gibson and Neuromancer and, you know, Snow Crash. Um, uh, you, you, have, you have virtual uh, landscapes that are mapped, you know, where, you, where, where, there's, where there's a uh, recognition of the density of information and density of population through certain representation means. But that's something that you guys have, this is only happening now. And this is something that you need to start to think about and recognize as you move forward. This is uh, Charles and Ray Eames, Powers of Ten, uh, The Power of Ten in 1977. A lot of good things happened in 1977, if you come to think of it. Star Wars, The Power of Ten, Christopher Alexander's Pattern Language. Yeah. But anyway, so if you haven't seen this movie, take a look at this. It's, it's amazing. You, you zoom out, and then you zoom back in. It really un helps you understand that scale is something that's really important. Facebook has billions of users. How are you going to represent that? How are you actually going to have meaningful connections with people you don't know? How do you come across serendipitous you know, encounters in a space like uh, Facebook? I mean, you can't, you can't right now. But that's something that needs to change. And information architects and user experience professionals, as well as architects, need to come together to think about this. And what about all those people that aren't being represented on the informational grid? Right? This is a photo by NASA. It's, it's where people are. But what about all the people who aren't represented because they're not connected to informational systems? So in closing, uh, I put this in there because it's just a really fun picture. You know, we have the duodecimal system embedded in the floor of the Seattle Central Library. And I thought this was a kind of a nice uh, throwback to when Dewey Decimal System actually mattered. Um, but in closing, you know, uh, Victor Hugo uh, in his Notre Dame de Paris said, Celi uh, tuera cela, which means, and translated, this will kill that. And it's, it's a scene where um, this abbot, I believe, uh, says that the printing press will kill architecture. Architecture, Gothic architecture especially, had it was information architecture. Look at the stained glass windows of Gothic architecture. They tell a story. They tell a biblical story. And that actually meant to be a lot to people who didn't know how to read. And so architecture has always had this long history of having information embedded in it. And this is something that is becoming more prominent and more um, relevant as we think about information architecture and what architecture and information architecture means in this new world this brave new world. Um, information has been textual, has been flattened in books. But what happens when you release it again? This is one thing that could happen and that we can regain as information architects, as architects, designing virtual and physical spaces which we can actually experience and we can actually have a visceral reaction to. This is Saint-Chapelle. In Paris, if you ha if you ever get a chance to go to Paris, don't I mean go to Notre Dame, but go to Saint Chapelle. This is the royal cathedral, and it's absolutely mind-blowingly beautiful. And there's a story, there's an information story embedded within it. And this is the potential of information architecture, and what you guys can look forward to in the coming years. <laughs>